In the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. It has been the teaching of the church for millennia that man's nature is corrupted by sin. That teaching certainly has drifted in the last century or so. And so it comes rather surprisingly to some that we would hear that the love of Christ is not the natural response of man. Our sin corrupts us. It corrupts our heart. And the result is that we love many other things in this life rather than God. And so, when we read the Gospels and we hear about the hatred, the despising, and the rejection and crucifixion of Christ, sometimes it's a little bit shocking to us as Christians. But reflecting back on that nature of man, it is not so shocking. What is, in fact, surprising is that you love Christ, but you don't love him first. He loves you first, and that brings forth love of him from you. If we truly loved Christ perfectly, we would always keep the commandments. That is, if we didn't struggle with this sinful nature. And so, as we reflect on those, kind of like we did in your examinations, all of a sudden it becomes rather clear that we have broken the first commandment. For who amongst us hasn't coveted something of someone else's instead of simply being content with what we have? Those parents over there are so much more cool than my mom and dad. Not only that, but look at that guy's job and how much he gets paid. Boy, I'd love that. And then, who amongst us hasn't told a lie to look a little bit better, including to our children? Why, yes, of course, I accomplished all of those things in high school. Or, for that matter, who hasn't told a lie to keep out of getting in trouble with our parents? And then, who hasn't been negligent, neg negligent or wasted anything? Or worst yet, perhaps, is who hasn't had anger burst forth in venomous rage as we, instead of loving those who are closest to us, simply huh, go off on them with our words. Or when we're little, we hit and kick our brother or sister. And then it, when it comes to the fourth commandment, we look at our parents and think, those rules are ridiculous. Why should I follow them anyway? So we hear Jesus' words today. Whenever our love shifts from him and his commandments, he calls us to repent. For each time we break the commandments, what is clear is that we, in fact, are revealing not our love of Christ, but our hatred of him. That we despise and reject him. That's the way of idolatrous hearts. Supplanting true God with idols of our own making. What's amazing to me is that the God who knows us and all of our weaknesses and all of our sin and all of our rejection of him still comes, comes to be with us and love us and care for us and do exactly what the Father commands him to do. Do you remember when you were a little kid and you were frightened at night? Who did you call out for? Oh, I know. Iron Man, come help me! No, I guess not. Black Widow? Oh, Thor, Captain America, all of those great superheroes in the Marvel comic universe, right? No. Wrong. 
Why did you call out for your mom and your dad? Because of every mighty act that they did for you? Probably more likely it's every little tiny act of love and sacrifice. Why then do our hearts cry out to gods that can't save us? When we were children, we knew our parents would come in and rescue us and comfort us. And I think how sad it must be if a child is sitting there thinking, I have to win the love of my mom, or I have to merit the kindness and affection of my father. Don't you think that would be like a living in a waking nightmare? Just awful. Parents should love their children simply because their love brought forth those children in their marriage. And in that, we're a reflection of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, for God is love, and that's part of his nature, and we are created in his image and likeness. And yet the corruption of our flesh perverts that love, and it turns itself inward. So that we love ourselves more than anyone else, more than anything else. Do you think that's why the people of Babel built that tower? Because they thought, you know, God really isn't going to look on us and preserve us. In fact, he's probably going to scatter us pretty soon. So what we need to do is build a massive tower. And then we'll make a name for ourselves, and maybe then we'll merit the love of God. Oh, such idolatry. <laughs> Instead of trusting that God will make a name for them, God loves them. It doesn't seem that way, does it, when He takes their tower and breaks it? <laughs> Seems kind of like a, a little kid who's mad at his buddy and knocks down the Lego tower, right? And then maybe says, I'm going home. How in the world is God showing his love by dispersing them in that way? He disperses so that he can gather. Gather after he sends forth his Holy Spirit into the world, proclaiming mercy and forgiveness. In some ways, I, I kind of envy you guys sitting over there. Well, you've completed two hard years of catechesis. Two hard years in that we did a lot of study of God's word as well as the catechism, right? But two hard years else, elsewise too. Which makes it really hard to get through this part of a sermon. I hate sometimes having tears, but that's the way of life, isn't it? Joy and sorrow all mixed together. Today's not the way it should be, is it? <laughs> but we sit here together in this body of Christ. And Christ, out of his love, helps us carry through. So the reason I envy you, by the way, because you're probably not up here and speaking like this, that's good. <laughs> but it's this. You in your youth have this fervent love of Christ. One that is not yet touched by age and sin and cynicism that have their way of cooling things off for us. And it takes what should be simple and it makes it so complex and uncertain. In fact, sometimes I wish I could be Samuel's age. Samuel's my five-year-old son. My 12-year-old son is over there being confirmed today. But I wish I could be Samuel's age again because there he sits with such confidence saying, well, Jesus loves everybody, Dad. Which I know is true. But in the midst of suffering and death, in the midst of the garbage of this world, in the midst of what we go through together sometimes, in the wounds that we create on accident or on purpose. I'm not so sure. 
And in these moments, what we need desperately is the work of Christ for us. What we need is the Holy Spirit to come and bring to our remembrance the mighty, loving acts of Christ. For this, in the midst of all of the garbage of this world, gives us certainty. Certainty that God chose you. That Christ died for you. And that his love is continually being poured out upon you. And so we who are a little bit older, oh, we need to hear this message over and over again, for we're foolish and slow of heart to believe. And we need to hear that Jesus' work is for us soul-sick sinners who stumble over and over again. That he's for those who just can't seem to get their lives together. He's for those who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life. He is for those who have been wounded, wounded by their own sin, wounded by the sins of others, wounded within the church. The Holy Spirit brings healing, for he brings us Jesus. He brings us Christ's forgiveness. He brings us Christ's life. He causes us to remember all of those things that we once knew in our childhood and found to be so certain. And he preaches them to us again so that we would remember in the midst of all of this that God is for us. So who can actually be against us? This, by the way, is what Jesus then tells us about this morning. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Well, what word? Jesus is not saying, go out there. You've got strength. You're going to fulfill all those commandments perfectly throughout the rest of your life. No, in fact, what he's saying is, I am clinging to you. Which brings us back to that little kid, you, calling out for your mom or dad in the middle of the night. There they'd come, right? And they'd comfort you with their words. And they'd hold you with their arms. And they'd wipe away your tears. And they would give you a peace that's found simply by them being close. Jesus does that too. He's holding on to us. He's got us. And he promises from the waters of holy baptism throughout your last breath to be with you always, even to the end of the age. He's guarding you. He is keeping you. He is holding fast to you. And so he says, hold on to me like a little child. Arms wrapped around mom. Your hand resting on dad's face as you fall back asleep. The world, the devil, even our flesh, attempt to take this comfort from us. Attempt to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But thanks be to God that he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when the world comes along and tries to convince you that there is no God, he would never come in the flesh, especially not for you. Here is what's proclaimed. Proclaimed by Paul, proclaimed by the apostles, proclaimed in the gospels, proclaimed throughout the scriptures. Jesus took on your flesh. True God, true man, as you guys confessed to me, right? I asked you that question. Is Jesus Christ true God? And you said, yes. <laughs> Is he true man? Yes. How do you know? And you gave all of those indicators from the scriptures. That Jesus rose from the dead. That you knew he was man because he died for you. And he does all of this to save you. Then in the face of all these things that try to tear you apart. You can confess that truth. Confess the truth that he's given you the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And out of love for you. He continues to proclaim that here Sunday after Sunday. 
Even today, bringing you his body and his blood. Bringing heaven down to the earth. Bringing the martyrs with him. For we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. This is what love does. It sacrifices and gives. As opposed to our self-love. Which sacrifices everybody else for the sake of me. Christ here comes to forgive you for that too, by the way. For he does love you and desires that you would live with him for all eternity. So, kind of a neat thing is going to happen then, right? After you do the whole confirmation bit, your stance will be different at the altar rail. For you've been catechized. And up to this point, what did you do with your arms usually when you'd come up? Yeah, you'd have them crossed, right? Not because you have a different faith or confession than ours. Yours was the same, but you needed a little more catechesis. And yet, Sunday after Sunday, just because you had your arms crossed over you, does that mean you didn't receive anything at the altar rail? No. Christ gave you his word of blessing. So also those who don't share the same confession with us regarding Christ's body and blood, they still receive something right here at this altar rail. Christ's word of blessing. His word of love for them. That's why you're here, right? Because even if that love has grown a little bit cold, even if it seems that you've not let Christ have his love have its way with you, Thus, your love for others has faltered. You know right here he's going to give you his love and his forgiveness and his mercy. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to send his Holy Spirit so that that fire of faith is kindled once again and burning. And we need it, don't we? Because as you look around, you're not the only one here who's hurting today. You're not the only one who's been broken by sin and the sins of others. The thing is, sometimes some of you just hide it a little bit better, right? And in this church, this holy Christian church, it's really tempting to focus on all of the sin and the blemishes and the hurt of others. But Christ calls us to look at something different today. That here, here he has made a home for you and for me. Oh, it's not a perfect home, right? It's filled with us sinners. And maybe kind of like my, my basement right now where I foolishly tore off part of the wallpaper, maybe it looks pretty bad sometimes. I want to close my eyes at points and not look at what I just did. But it's home. This is your home. Filled with sinners who desire nothing more than Christ's love. And he gives it. And take heart because this this isn't the end of things. Jesus comes and brings you peace and also promises to establish a home with God the Father. So now we're... We're in the midst of this life crying out to the one who can save us, calling upon his name, looking forward to that day when we finally leave this home to be with him. In that home that shall never end. In that place where there's perfect peace. Where we never have to face hatred or disappointment or sorrow again. We'll only know Christ's love and peace enjoy. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord.